Welcome to um, the Oceanside Museum of Art virtual conversation between uh, Dr. Dennis Rogers and uh, sculptor Manuelita Brown. On behalf of the Oceanside Museum of Art and the Board of Trustees and the OMA team, I would like to welcome you to our event tonight. We hope to welcome you back to our museum very soon, but we're grateful to stay connected with everyone via this virtual Museum from Home programs. My name is Alessandra Moctezuma, and I'm the guest curator of exhibition, the exhibition 20 Women Artists Now, which is going to be opening at the museum on March 13th. I'm also a professor and gallery director at San Diego Mesa College, and I was invited to organize this exhibition. Uh, this conversation tonight is um, leading up to, um, to this wonderful exhibit of 20 women artists. Uh, Manuelita Brown is one of the featured artists, and she is also included in a solo exhibition at the museum titled Inspired uh, Selections from the OMA staff which is on view now and through May 23rd. We would like to thank Paula Doss and Beth Epperson for underwriting tonight's program, and also the title sponsor, Robin Lipman, in honor and memory of Patty Coop Ryder uh, and funding for the TWA catalog with additional support from an anonymous don donor. Um, the exhibition will be on view from March 13 to July 1st. So we invite you uh, to join our virtual programming. We're hoping that um, at some point the museum will reopen its doors and we will be able to have you come and see it in person. Uh, in the meantime, the museum store is open in the museum lobby and we will be, the have, we will be having the catalog available. And it's open Thursday through Saturday from 10 from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Sundays from 11 to 4 p.m. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce um, our guests for this virtual conversation, uh, Dr. Dennis Rogers and sculptor artist Manuelita Brown. And I'm just going to, um, before they begin, I'm just going to read a little bit about them. Uh, Dr. Dennis Rogers is a San Diego native, mother of two and professor of art history at San Diego Mesa College. She earned a bachelor's in visual arts and criticism from UCSD and a master's in art history from SDSU and a PhD in visual studies with an emphasis in feminist studies from UC Irvine. She's professor of art history at San Diego Mesa, specializing in modern and contemporary art with a focus on women, African American, and uh, African Americans and the diaspora, and how indigenous artifacts inform contemporary ide ideologies. Um, she's a coordinator of the Mesa College's uh, Constance Carroll Humanities Institute and manages the Mesa College World Cultures Art Collection and recently received a Mellon American Council of Learned Societies Fellowship. She's also a board member of the San Diego African American Museum of Fine Art. She has curated exhibitions at the San Diego Public Library, Mesa College Art Gallery, the San Diego Museum of African American Art, and the San Diego Museum of Art. Having spent decades as a wife, mother, and teacher of mathematics, Manuelita Brown shifted later in her life to focus on being a professional artist and sculptor. Trained by veteran sculptors, including, including Bruno Lucchesi from New York, uh, Nigel Constam from Italy, and Simon Kogan from Washington, Manuelita has been honored with numerous awards accompanying her participation in many exhibitions throughout the country. Specializing in bronze figurative and portrait sculpture, Manuelita has completed private, corporate, and public commissions in La Jolla, Encinitas, Baltimore, and the UCSD campus. We're very excited to welcome both of them today. And um, with, without any further ado, we're going to begin the program. Thank you, Dr. Rogers and Manuelita, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. And, and thank you all for attending and thank you, um, Manuelita, for this opportunity. 
to um, be in conversation with you and to share your work with the audience. And so I, I'd like to start by um, um, viewing a few pieces of your work that connect to the 20 Women Artists Now show, because after reviewing your work, I noted that there is a strong emphasis on women, femininity, these timeless um, women who are in different states of being. So I'd like to start there by showing um, the first work, Mbokodo. And the um, if you could talk a little bit about the piece where our, as we adjust the, um, the image, there's the, the woman standing with um, corn in her hands. And she's, again, talk a little, if you could talk a little bit about the title of the work and also the way she's represented. Yes, thank you. She actually has tulips, tulip bulbs oh. in her hand and under her foot. Um, it was, I did this sculpture thing about South Africa and its emergence from dependence upon the Dutch and who, who colonized the area. And that's what the tulips represent, represent the Dutch colonization. Uh, so at that time, they were becoming independent and um, essentially rooting out Dutch influence as much as possible. So that's why she has tulips pulled up by the roots and tulips that she actually is uh, stepping on to uh, under her foot. Uh, so she represents uh, sort of the, the young African, South African nation coming up. The name in Bokoro, I that name from a friend who was originally from South Africa. It's from the Kos language, and it's the name of a stone that's used to grind their meal for their daily bread. Um, this stone is wrapped and pure and clean. It doesn't it doesn't get washed or uh, that sort of thing. It just is always kept and protected. And I felt that was a good name because I feel that's what the countrymen want to do with their country. See, and that's my that's where my reference to corn, the title of the work, the grinding of the the meal. But the the tulips, yeah. the, the the connection to the Dutch trade, also. Mm -hmm. um, and so so we're gonna see as we look at your work this this rich history that you incorporate into. The subject matter of your work and this connection to the femininity, and I I like the the viewers to note how um, with that there's the 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 figure besides the title and the reference to the tulips, there are these women in different states of of being. Um, you can say different psychological states, introspective states, and if we go to boxed in, um, you you content a lot on how there are these. Um, whether they're obstacles or struggles or stresses that women face. And so tell us a little bit about Boxed In. What is Boxing Her? What is Boxing Her In? Well, um, I was thinking mostly about in Boxed In about the, the, what happens to many people. And it's not just women, but, but I am one of three daughters. So I, I think a lot about what happens to our lives. Uh, but this is a case where women are sometimes just like other people, you find yourself in, with limitations. And sometimes you adjust to those limitations and let them become uh, a sort of a safe place to be within those limitations. You don't have to explore, you don't have to try something new. So the, the question becomes, are your limitations something that you're staying within uh, for comfort or are they things that you're trying to push out of your way? So I, I try to make a, a tension in the piece where you can't really tell whether she's caressing the wall or pushing against the wall. And right. that's, that's for someone to determine how are your you know, limitations or how are the things that you face each, each day how are you adjusting them? Are you trying to overcome them? Are you extending them and sort of living within a, a space that's that's become less than it could be? It's, she looks very um, tranquil 
almost in this in this space and you have this contrast between the, the flowing fabric and the way she's like you say she's almost caressing the walls but then you have this this box which she's in, contained right. in and the way you perceive it it could be limiting or it could be you know something that allows for expression free expression the sense of freedom but i would like to um talk a little bit about some of your your inspirations for your work artists who have inspired you and you we did talk about um elizabeth catlett and there's a photograph of you and elizabeth catlett and you two are in conversation so can you tell us a little bit about your well first why elizabeth catlett um inspired you and also um what are you two talking about right here what's going on in this conversation <laughs> Well, in that conversation, it happened to be that she was a featured um, guest for an exhibition that I was in. She was a featured speaker for an evening program, and I was thrilled to meet her and was excited to have her come to look at some of my work, which was on exhibit there. And we sat there talking about I was doing what she had done um, I was just was like a, in a groupie, you know, thrilled to meet someone that I <laughs> admired a great deal. Uh, so it was it was quite interesting to have her with me um, for that few minutes. It was also interesting that as I learned more about her when I was younger, before having met her, that I realized that some of the work I did was reminded me a lot of, of work that she had done. And unfortunately, art education was not part of what I had earlier. So I was a little late learning about her work. But, and then to find that some of the themes of her work and the themes that I was, I was working with overlapped, that we had things in common. And that was, uh, it was gratifying and it was also inspiring. Yes. So we, we do have a few, um, we've, we've place pieces together that um, you have done with work by Elizabeth Catlett. Um, Target is one of Elizabeth Catlett's um, pieces. And um, next to Target, we have a portrait of America's son. And you saw it's a portrait of your son. And right. later on... Yes, of my younger son. It's a portrait of my younger son, yes. And um, later on, we're gonna we're gonna talk about your family, but but here there's um, one thing that I found interesting is Elizabeth Catlett's title, um, Target, and we um, talk about um, African American males, and we can talk about especially recent events um, nationally as well as internationally. But your your title's America's son, and he's your son, and we will see him later, and I believe he's here. <laughs> tonight as well but can you tell us your your choice for the title in this case when i i did this piece when he was a new graduate of university and he did some traveling he had gone to several countries abroad and it became clear to him and to me that he wasn't just my son because when he traveled abroad, he said he never, he never realized how American he felt when mm -hmm. he was, a, 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 except when he was abroad. And um, it was a comment that I think he made just in general, describing some of his experiences. But it occurred to me that this person that I had given birth to, that my husband and I had raised was really not just ours. He had also been influenced by the country he was raised in and that wherever he went, he would be not just the son of William Manuelita, he would be the son of America. And so that's how I ended up with that name. It also, he, I think he was beginning to show uh, his separate individuality uh, from the rest of the family in a way and um he, he appears very very confident in the way that he looks out at the viewer confident independent ready to take on on the world yes 
and all of those ideas that you, as well as the ideas he learned living here in the, the U.S., he's taking with him. I and agree. Journey, yeah, that journey. sounds like a good description of him. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and he can correct me. <laughs> but I would like to also take, a, there's a, a work of yours, Retreat. And um, looking at um, your your connection, the connections that you saw with Elizabeth Catlett's work, and it's it's the way that and and these two pieces together, we're going to see this frequently with your work. These intersecting lines and the way you you portray the the, the female body, and they become um, expressive physically, but also there's this strong psychological effect that you've been able to to capture. In work and I know there's a there there's a connection in your history to psychology. Does that and do you incorporate that background into your work, or how are you able to capture, say that that feeling, that emotion, and form? Well, that's part of the mystery, I think, of, of, <laughs> of making art is is how do you get from? Uh, I used to say how I get what's in my brain to my hands. And it's not necessarily um, something that I can solve. I actually started studying psychology because as a mathematics teacher, I was always impressed with how one solved problems. You could mm. have a problem you were looking at, and this is particularly in geometry. Uh, geometry is one of my favorite areas of mathematics, and that might show in my work as well, right? Um, so. What I, what I wanted to know is, what is this aha moment? And I wanted to study and find out more about that. I decided that one of the things I could do was go to graduate school. And there was a psychology department and they were discussed, the, the one group was uh, dealing with how the brain works, how you, how you solve problems, how you organize data in your brain. And I thought, well, I'll find out more about solving problems. Well, it turns out that figuring out what's going on in the brain is uh, still a very infantile <laughs> study. <laughs> that, it's a mystery. That <laughs> I, I wasn't uh, able to offer a, a lot. I enjoyed the time. I liked the, the discussions. I liked the study. I always liked learning. So it was fun to do, but I don't think I came any closer to understanding <laughs> how our brain works to communicate from one idea to the next or how it works for my brain to then be expressed through clay or something in my hand so but what i uh, what i see in your i mean there's at least from my perspective i can almost place myself in a, a position based on the way and we'll see this with more works the way that you you position the body I mean, where is she at this moment? Maybe we've all been at that moment at some point and we can connect in, in that way because it's the way she's like self-contained. And yes. there may be moments in life we all to, you know, that's care. But I would also like to, um, there's one other image by um, Elizabeth Catlett, a print um, survivor. And something that you do with your work, you also, you have a variety of subjects. Sometimes they're, they're women alone, introspective women like we've seen, but you also focus on um, historical figures. You focus on great leaders. You focus on notable figures throughout history. And this was actually, um, Elizabeth Catlett's print was based on a, a photograph of a woman who, who was a, a former enslaved woman from about 1937 in, in Alabama. But you also have, um, to talk about the breadth of your work, you have figures, if we can go to Butt by Grace, of women who have spent their lives working. And you, and yes. just like we saw in the previous image, you were able to capture kind of the, 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 the stresses or the, um, the effects of all of that work over time. And um, so if you say a little bit about um, this work and is there a specific subject that, that, it, that is behind this work? Or, and I know you've done this in a couple of sizes, there's large scale and small scale. Right, uh, yes, there is a story behind this piece. Um, my husband and I were traveling in Italy and there was a woman there. So this could be any woman in any number of places. And she was there 
trying to get Lyra from various people, uh, had her basket out. And I was very moved by just her stance and the way that she was, was working the crowd in a way, but very apologetically, but at the same time, out of necessity. And I happened to snap a picture of her and then put the lira I had in my pocket in her basket. <laughs> Uh, so when I came back, I was thinking about her again and thought, this woman could be in any city, anywhere in the world. And she represents all the people who are dependent on others in order to get by because they've not been able to move through the system in a way that's self-sustaining. Uh, and it just touched me. So I ended up doing a sculpture of it and feeling like it needed to be larger because even as a very small sculpture, people would bend over to try to see her face. And I thought, well, that's, that's actually a very good serendipity that people want to know who this woman is. And so the large one, I hope I'll be looking to see if people do the same thing because should they bend over to look at this lady's face, the surprise will be they'll see their own face <laughs> because it's a reflective material there instead of a person's face. So I, I, I very much want people to, I, to, to identify with this woman, not feel that it's a person that they couldn't relate to, that couldn't be them. Or just walk by and walk by like and not she realize. just doesn't exist. Exactly. But that, exactly. that's a, a question I, I want to come back to, how you are able to connect with audiences, how you how you connect with people who have, have purchased your work and you, and going back to your, your thought process and when you are creating these pieces. But I, I would like to show a couple of others because I want people to know a little bit more about your history. You also created a work of, speaking of your, the breadth of your, your subject, Sojourner Truth. And this was a commission um, for Thurgood Marshall College. And there, there's also a story, story here. And I wanna be conscious of our, our time. <laughs> there's, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep you all in suspense. I wanna come back to this story later on as well, but I wanna make the connection between um, historical figures. I mean, you, Sojourner Truth's story and the way you chose to tell her story in your own words, but could you briefly tell us where you, because we see many um, representations of Sojourner Truth, but where did you go? Well, most of, the, all of the representations that I've seen are Sojourner as an elderly woman. And I read Professor Nell Urban Painter's biography of her in starting this sculpture and found that I thought she was a very dynamic, strong person and did not like, it did not appeal to me to represent her in her much later years when she was well known, had already been, been in the offices of President Lincoln Etc. I wanted her to be the person who was just setting out determined to make a difference in the world. And when she had just changed her name from Isabella Baumfrey to Sojourner Truth, because that's what she was going to do, travel the world and travel the countryside and tell the truth. Uh, and she, she was actually an itinerant preacher as well. Uh, so I envisioned her as a much younger woman um, People thought she was six feet tall. She was unusually tall for the time and uh, quite a strong woman. Didn't wear delicate clothes. She, she wore sort of handmade, uh, hand woven cloths and, and walked. She walked from country to countryside to countryside giving sermons and speeches. Um, so this is how I envisioned her, a very determined woman who was ready to go out into the world and, and make a difference. And the way you capture her in step, 
in that, I mean, she's on a mission in your sculpture. This is not a static figure. We can step in line right with her and having yes. that space to move around her. But you, you embody these, these, um, these figures in, in, in various ways. And I just want to quickly show a couple of other examples and then we'll um, stop for a moment and talk a little bit about your background, but dreaming. Um, just quickly, you you capture, uh, again, these states of being. And I want here, we, we talked about the way you capture kind of the psychology of a, a subject, but it's also the way you capture form. And you mentioned your mathematics background. And I want you all to notice that the vertical lines here and the way the body is in these, you have these verticals and horizontals and these diagonals and the way that her form is picked up by the fabric, but she still looks very natural and very calm. But you have these kind of rectilinear forms in this space. And then one other, and I'll stop talking, is um, <laughs> posed, <laughs> posed too, because now we have these sweeping forms. And I mean, she's in the midst of a, a spin or a performance or a dance. So your versatility in capturing form, I mean, just in the few examples that we're seeing is um, amazing as an artist. It, it demonstrates your, your achievement as an artist. But I would like to, um, to stop and go back in time and shift focus a little bit and ask you about your, um, your beginnings, your upbringing, your, your life as a as an artist. So could you, you tell us a little bit about your, your childhood, just briefly, where you grew up, your earliest experiences with art and so on? Well, I, I grew up in Virginia, the eldest daughter of three. Um, my father, a chauffeur and, pub, and, and as a public chauffeur or cab driver, but he was a private chauffeur at the time I was born. Um, they were my mother, a high school graduate, my father did not, but was also was quite a gifted person in terms of penmanship and, and drawing. He liked to draw with, for us. When he would tell us stories, he would draw pictures. Um, so being raised with, within, within that family, it was very accepted to, to express oneself by drawing and uh, telling stories and, uh, and all kinds of creative endeavors. But it was not something that um, we thought of as careers. So we were always in, in thinking in terms of how you will earn a living with three daughters. You wanted to be sure we were self-sufficient. <laughs> so, so can we, sh I'm sorry. Well, but, but we did do things like art projects and things like that. So. I think we have a photo of one of my very first yes. pieces of artwork <laughs> that was for sale, right? <laughs> and so this was done on a playground for on the summer playground. And at the end of the summer, we could put our things out. And, and you know, most people, the parent or someone bought it, but actually this was the grandmother of a friend of mine who bought this piece uh, for 50 cents. It um, and and it turned out that she kept it for years because when she died, her daughter, who was a friend of my mom's, said, I found this in, my, in, in grandma's room and it has Manuelita's name on it. So she asked if I wanted it back and I did get it back. So that, that was the story of that piece. Well, can we, so how old are you when you Somewhere around eight or nine years old. <laughs> yeah. But, but which is interesting, I signed both my first and last name. Now I only sign my first name. <laughs> but at eight, you are a, a practicing artist. <laughs> You're yes. What I find incredible is that you were able to, she cherished this so much that you were able to. She kept it all of all that time. For and you a were very able long to time. Yes. 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 But well, we actually have um, photos of your, your parents. You mentioned your father was a chauffeur. Mm -hmm. your, your, and here is, and that's you and your mom. Yes. yes. And then you also have a, um, a little sister as well. Yes, so we I actually play. had two sisters, but by the, this picture, only one of them had been born so far. Okay. And so you had, the, the, as you said, the um, three, take, raising three girls. Right. As you said. 
And then um, something that I, I noticed within your work, um, family is, is very strong in your work, besides women, families, nurturers. And there's a, um, a very powerful sculpture, I'll Fly Away, which shows a family. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a portrait of a family, again, just like Sojourner Truth that's on the move. And so can you tell us how you came to, the, the, was your family, your history, an inspiration for this work here? Actually, no. This, the, the inspiration for this work was because I was, I was commissioned by a couple whose family had moved out when, the, when Oklahoma had a very, was going through all the Dust Bowl things and, and a lot of people moved from Oklahoma into California. And this couple's family had moved during that time. But at the more I talked with them about th that journey of their family, it became much more universal. And so I started actually thinking about the runaway slaves and the fact that, that if they ran away, they basically ran with the clothes on their back or what they could bundle up. And the, the woman has bundled up a quilt topping that she has whatever they're going to be able to carry with them across her shoulder and the man is the carrying their child. Um, but in the process of working on it, there was so many things going on around the globe where people were fleeing for safety to find some safe haven to raise a family or to just be a family. And they were people coming from the southern continents up into North, southern South America, up into North America. There were people in Africa that were fleeing from one area of a country to another because of war. There were people in Europe during, during the time I did this that were having problems with uh, uh, one group of, of people. This turned out to be a religious, more of a religious war in, in the European countries. So this is happening all over the globe that people are fleeing one place, trying to find a peaceful and safe place to, to live and to grow up and grow up. Right, and you, you go from individual families to groups, to regions, to the globe. And as you mentioned, the Underground Railroad, and there are people trying to escape turmoil in their country. So we talk about the great migration here in the United yes. States. And even, even today, people fleeing countries where they cannot live safely with their, their families. And so that timelessness of your work is, is captured here as well. But we can shift now because you did start a family of your own. And so we have a photograph of you. Yep, that's, that was the week before we got married. <laughs> and, his and graduation. So, and graduation, and he's in a. He was an ROT, He was an ROTC, so he graduated bachelor's degree and also accepted a commission in the army. And um, you also have your own family, and so we have yes. a photograph <laughs> as well. And so, can you tell us a little bit about? Um, your role as a, a mother, your, your um, husband's role as a father, again, raising your, your family. Yeah, we have two sons. And uh, at, the, at the time of those photographs, my husband was a researcher in microbiology laboratory. Um, so the, our roles were whatever would work <laughs> because I was, teach, I was teaching school and he was uh, in the laboratory and teaching at the university. So we had to deal with all the events of, of childhood and, and um, little things like Indian guides at the Y, he was, he was involved in that or going to little league games or shirt and cap games. You, you mix it all up and do the best you can with all of those things. So what role did art play during this time period? Because you were working as a teacher. Yes. Time. Yes. Well, art in that time meant um, building a bird cage with my son. 
um, taking woodworking classes at, at the high school at night to build their furniture, design and build bedroom furniture, or designing a house, um, helping to build a house or remodel a house, uh, making clothes. Let's see, I think I made all their t-shirts and sweatshirts and uh, made my clothes, knitting, crocheting, building things. It was, my art always consisted of making something out of something else. So whether it was um, building a, a, a birdhouse or building a mailbox or making clothing, even making lights. I was inspired by the lighting at the Civic Center downtown San Diego with the crumpled mm. metal and light bulbs inside. I don't know if it's still that way, but I got some heavy gauge aluminum and made a light fixture for the wall in one of our rooms to, to model after that. So there were always things to make and do while I was in the process of raising children um, and not doing art. <laughs> so you were in <laughs> Well, you're, you were still fulfilling your, your that creative side. You yes. were wild race. I mean, it, it speaks to some of, you know, moms and wives and, you know, your job juggling all this, but still having that, that outlet. But you, you also, when you train your, your background was in mathematics and mm -hmm. also engi engineering Well, engineering first and, but mathematics being a part of that. And so when you actually be before we um, we do that, I want to um, before we leave your family, I want to um, share a couple of other photos because there are um, sculptures of your your children, your grandchildren, and also mm -hmm. there's this very nice photograph with Sojourner Truth of a um, a young boy looking up at her, and having that you you talk about um, working with your your children and. Um, them being the subjects of, as well as participants in the creative process with the birdhouses and so mm -hmm. on. There's this connection that you, you, um, your work makes with with the youth, whether teaching about history. And then there's the the sculpture Z, your granddaughter. Mm -hmm. And yes. so there, they are always um, whether you're. This is when you were actually creating the bronze sculptures. But again, to reiterate, family has always been. A strong part of your your career, whether yes. in well, it's a big part of my life. So yes, <laughs> yes. You can't it, it right. invades all of it. Yes, <laughs> yes. But, and you you capture that, and so um, we have your granddaughter Z here, and and seeing your family in the photos. But I I would like to go back. Well, so while all of this is going on, you are um, teaching. But can you speak a little bit about some of the um, obstacles that you face when you were going back to family and career and, and so on, and also fulfilling that creative side, because you, you, you started out teaching, but that wasn't, from conversations we had, that wasn't ultimately your, your initial path. Okay. Correct. I had not planned to be a teacher. And um, I actually majored in mathematics, not majored in, um, in anything related to teaching. And in fact, started working with computers when they still had vacuum tubes. <laughs> and the computer that, that I worked with in college was as big as a small dining room and you had to worry about the temperature because it was all a lot of vacuum tubes. But I went out to um, get a job in near Tacoma, Washington. And I applied at Boeing Aircraft and I got an interview because they thought my resume was quite good. But then the, the man who, re who interviewed me told me very frankly that I'm sorry, you know, we, we really can't hire you. You might get pregnant or you might leave with your husband mm -hmm. to go to another town before we've essentially gotten enough work out of what you know, you have, you have just gone through the basic training area, you could be gone. So it was the kind of thing that no one would dare say now, but um, le left me without a job that required a math degree uh, and, and would use the experience that I already had 
But I found another job that because um, I wanted to work and have something to do. Um, and it was at a uh, child care and welfare center. And I think the criteria that that got me the job was I knew what it what to do to double clutch a truck. And I and I also didn't mind helping to build a bird a tree house or something. Um, <laughs> So that's how I think I got the job. But in the meantime, I also was asked to help a young, a young um, patient in the center who was deaf to count, to do math, to, to be able to count using his, um, his hands. And so I thought, well, you know, it wasn't so bad teaching. And I tutored some of the students who were going to high school. So I thought, well, you know, teaching isn't so bad after all. <laughs> and, um, so then I went back, when we went back to Oregon, moved back from the state of Washington to Oregon, there was a Ford Foundation. They were looking for teachers because the, the airplane, airline industries, not airline, but the aircraft industries, aerospace industries, were having problems. They were ne needing a lot more teachers in, in mathematics and the sciences. And so they were offering these grants to get people to come from that industry into teaching. And I happened to get one of those grants and started teaching uh, mathematics and never had been planning to teach before that, but I enjoyed it very much. So I, I said, well, this will, this will last a, few, a decade or so. Yeah. And I think maybe 20 years later <laughs> or so I was leaving teaching. But so, uh, it was a good career. So, so let's jump ahead to when you, you decided to make the shift because there are other um, positions that you held before you became a um, full-time artist. So describe the transition from teaching or being involved in education to focusing on art full-time. Well, that transition came about be, um, mainly because children had grown up um, and I just wanted to do more. And I decided, well, I need to find out first if I, if I can do the, the kind of art that I originally thought of years ago wanting to do, uh, again, of my brain and hands connected. And so the way that I decided to explore that was through community college classes. I did a life drawing class first, and then after that, I did a life sculpting class, which was the picture that's up now I did in that class. Uh, it was a way of having models <laughs> uh, for, for, the, for an inexpensive price relatively, because it didn't cost much to go to a community college, and, and it was a great resource. So- I'm sorry to interrupt. I have to Go put ahead. a little plug in, a little plug in for the community college. You yes. <laughs> you went the work that you uh, created here. Can was that Mesa up? College? Yes, it was. <laughs> it was at Mesa College. Yes. Uh, yes. Actually, I did uh, several classes at Mesa College. I did with Ross Stockwell. I did classes in life life sculpting. And then I did another class at the time that was foundry class. And I don't think they do a foundry class anymore, but fortunately that term I took the foundry class, I met the gentleman who owned the foundry and he was my foundryman for 20 years. So he became the person that I worked with for all of the cast work that I did all the way through doing the Triton for UC San Diego. He was my foundryman. So it's, it's you. So your one of your earliest works is in um, this terracotta clay. And then mm -hmm. if we could go to just a minute, um, just four years later, you are now you've made the connections to the foundry and you're you're creating works in um, bronze. Right. Here. And also, um, again, the what is consistent is the. The, again, the focus on, and again, the transition to this material. I mentioned the sculpture, the, the Titan at UCSD. We also have a commission you receive for the uh, for UTC. 
the Dolphins and, and UTC. Right. Could. The Dolphins and UTC is actually what forced the, forced the transition between teaching and sculpting full time. Because when I, when I was, um, when I got the commission to do the dolphin, I was still teaching and I had to use all of my leave time to get the project finished. And I thought, no, I think I need to just stop doing the teaching altogether and uh, concentrate on, on doing the sculpture. So um, that was probably mm -hmm. the, the, the time when I just made that decision. And, and, and we started moving forward. Being a full-time. Being, being a full-time full artist, yes. So, so now that you are in, um, hopefully we can see the images of the, um, the dolphins. Can we see, there we go. Mm -hmm. So um, the, now that you're a full-time artist and this is your, your main focus, how did, you, how did you break in? How did you, um, but did, was this kind of a stepping stone to the to exposure? How did you draw an audience? Did you have a particular audience in mind? Discussion process and commissions that you received. How did you make? How did you break into that? This new world. Well, one could argue whether I have yet or not. <laughs> <laughs> I would say you have. <laughs> you <ask me. laughs> um, <laughs> well, the reason I say whether I have yet or not is because recently there was a, um, an article in one of the national sculpture magazines about monuments. And they, in that magazine, they mentioned a number of Sojourner Truth sculptures. Mine was not one of them. <laughs> so I said, well, not everybody knows about what I'm doing. So... Um, so then that, that means that there's still work to be done for, for people to recognize what some of the pieces are that I've contributed to the, to the public. But um, basically, it's like a, we had a chemistry teacher who would give very difficult tests when I was in undergraduate school. And if you ask him a question, basically he'd say, use everything you know. Mm -hmm. And so th that was a, a, a good comment that I've taken with me for a lot of, lot of situations. So it's like, use what you know and take advantage of opportunities as they arise. You know, be prepared to do something with the things that happen. And sometimes I do well at that and sometimes I don't. But overall, it's, each thing is a stepping stone to the next. Uh, whether you have done it well or done it poorly, you've got you've learned something and you can move on to the next challenge. Um, and so how do you stay true to who you are with those challenges? What what grounds you in your work? What what are say something that you would not compromise or sacrifice in your in your work? Uh, that's that, that now here's an example of when I had to learn a lesson by doing something I didn't want to do. Uh, the first time I did um, the model for the Sojourner Truth, it was in response to doing a monument for uh, a community in New England where she had lived. And I made the final cut, but then there was a con concern that she was too plain. She needed a fancier bonnet or whatever. And I didn't like the whole concept of doing that, but I thought, well, I, this, I'm early in, in, in this process. Let me go ahead and give it a try. So I did something that I did not want to do and it still wasn't accepted. And I really would have been upset if it had been accepted because I didn't like what, it, what, that, was, what that represented. Uh, so I was actually pleased that, that I didn't get that job. And as soon as that was turned down, I destroyed that model and kept oh. the original one. Um, with the bonnet. With the bonnet the way it is there. Yeah, I destroyed the one with the fancy French bonnet, or whatever it was. <laughs> but um, that was another lesson from one of my early teachers who wrote in 
one of these little books than when you're graduating from school, you know, like a yearbook, about being true to oneself. And mm. so I, I thought now that was a case where I didn't, oh, didn't listen to myself and I did something that I regretted and would have been very upset if they finally said, oh, this is what we want, because I didn't want that. It wasn't mm. the representation I wanted to make. Um, so I just, I, just to remind myself periodically, what, are you, what is it you want to be there 100 years from now? One of the reasons I like bronze is it will be here for a very long time. So who am I, who do I want to represent and who do I want people to know? Uh, 100 so, so, years from now. so why don't we do, why don't we take a look at um, some of your work? Over mm -hmm. time, there's um, Blue Man's Break. And we'll go through these because we are um, we're running um, short on time and I want to make time for questions. So there's mm -hmm. there's Blue Man's Break. And um, you, you made a, a, a reference to your, your father, even though this is not your father, your, but it, you said your father also played the guitar. Yes. But there's this reference to John Henry. Yeah, that was a favorite song that he had liked to sing. Uh, was about John Henry, the steel driving man. And, um, and he liked blues music. So when I well, may had this image in mind of the guy with the guitar taking a break, um, mm. it, was, it was because of him that, that that appealed to me. And then you have a, a series of works where you, you have these various titles that go across regions, across cultures, like agape is next, mm -hmm. which um, to give love and um, loving yourself and you right. show her as embracing, loving herself, some, some self care. And when you, as we, we go to the, the, um, the next one, which is Alofa Tele. So when you, when you look for, language for terms is this based on books that you've read or places you've traveled or experiences you've had or people or, i've met or people you <laughs> yeah, yeah because a lofe tele is a samoan word and it happened that the teller at my credit union was from samoa when i was working on this piece and you notice both of the last two pieces actually in the in one in the greek or in the samoan are about love right and um, and so I would a I asked the Samoan uh, lady that I was talking to, how would you express love that's not love between a man and a woman, but just love for another human being? Period. And she told me what what the words would be, alofa tele. And so that's there's the a word. there's a piece of you, your story. It's not just representing something that's separate from you. There is something about your experience that is embodied in you. You were people you encounter. Yes. In, in terms that resonate with you. Right. That resonate with you. We also have Nubian beauty, mm -hmm. another um, piece. And the and, and so I'm gonna leave this up here for a moment for um, everyone to see. And then you also have, um, and that's the and that's the true story, right? And we have this image of you have the it's like this matriarch who is telling this story to the children. Two children. That has an interesting background because we were in Ghana, and a, a woman was showing us around, showing a whole group of us around, and. Um, she was telling these Americans, these Black Americans who were in Ghana, who knew nothing about uh, Ghana, and she was trying to essentially give us our history. And, and so I have been, actually, it, this, this is a model pretty close to who the woman looked like who was talking to us. And she's telling her story, to, and these children are, were, were what I thought we were. We were being told stories, like a, a grandmother would tell the stories to the children. And even though we were adults, uh, but that was, that was the message that I was 
was trying to say. So you're reliving your childhood and storytelling. Yes. In this, in this piece. Yes. And then there's there's another La Vida in Piazza Cara Dia. La Vida in Piazza Cara Dia. And I and don't so, speak Spanish, but I'm trying <laughs> to learn once in a while. <laughs> And I remember you, you told me about a com the conversation with Elizabeth Catlett in, in, in Spanish. Yes. Yes. But, but um, this piece here, and you, I would like you to, to tell the um, everyone here how that first to translate the, t the title, some may already translate, but the way you explained it to me and what it means. And it, it's a message that we can actually get to a point where we can end and open up with questions. Okay. Uh, the life begins again each day is, is the translation. Um, and it begins again each day, just like it begins for an infant when they come out of the womb. So the woman is in, this figure is in a um, position that would be typical for a child in the womb. And she's just on a pillow, or he could be, but it's, she's just on a pillow, like she's asleep in this position, this fetal position. But it isn't a retreat from the world. It's like a beginning of the new day. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can look at this like when you wake up, you are now starting life anew. You don't have to, you don't have to bring along with you yesterday and the many yesterdays before you can actually begin life again. That's a beautiful sentiment to wake up every day. Yeah. New day. Wake up to a new day. New day. Every day. And so be, before we open it up to, um, to questions, I'm going to have us um, go through um, just for a, a few seconds each, have the, the audience see a few more examples of your work and then end with the piece that is um, being incorporated into the, the show. And Alessandra, you're going to have to um, remind me the, um, we'll, we'll start with Uphill Struggle, but you can see you have, um, Portraits of Thurgood Marshall, and, and then you also have a portrait of Henson. You have um, portraits of workers, and this woman here, um, Ms. Toledo, it was 100 years old in this portrait. She was a survivor of the Tulsa, Oklahoma race riot of 1921. And so, uh, again, the complexity of your work. And then this is one of your recent pieces from 2020. Um, and you described it as your most explicit protest piece. So, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, some 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 can see the protest uh, element in some of the work that others don't see it in, but this one's right. pretty explicit, right? right? You can't miss this one, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. And and so um, we can um, talk. About, perhaps that can be incorporated into the the questions. And so um, first, I would like to um, thank you for sharing, sharing your, your story with all of us and, and giving me this amazing opportunity to have this conversation with you, with you. And so I'd like to invite the um, audience to um, come, come up with questions. Some of you have already started, but we have a, a couple of students who have recorded questions. Mesa College students have, um, a couple of students have recorded questions. So while you all are typing your questions in the Q&A, um, we can play those questions and then Manuelita can respond to those questions. Okay. Hi, this is Brown. My name is Alina. A piece of your artwork that really caught my eye was the artwork titled Girlfriends. I wanted to know what exactly inspired you to put this piece of art together. Thank you, Alina. Um, Girlfriends reminds me of the time when I was a teenager or preteen, when you would sit with your friends and, and talk to each other. Uh, but, and the reason I did the sculpture, however, is because I actually was looking and admiring a painter's work. And he saw me admiring it. And he said, would you like that piece? Of course, he wanted to sell it, right? 
And I said, well, yes, if, if I could afford it, I would buy it right now. It really is quite a, a piece that I can identify. With. And he said, well, if you did a sculpture based on the image, then we'll trade. And so I did. So I actually have his original artwork on my wall, which shows his daughter and her friends on a Baltimore, uh, Boston soap steps. I was in Washington, D.C. when I was that age. So my steps were quite similar. Any city housing uh, group would look like that. And, um, and that's how the, the sculpture came about. It's really sort of like the typical thing that young teen, preteen girls would do. Sit, they would join together to share their secrets and, and tell stories. Thank you. We have another question. Hello, my name is Rebecca. And I was viewing the brass sculpture um, called La Vida en Pieza Cada Dia. And I had a question. I was wondering, would you imply the focal point be the position in which the woman is lying down for this particular work of art? Thank you. Uh, yes, I think her position is important uh, because that's a position that we find great comfort in because one that that is a position we were in it's even before we were born. It's also a, a comfortable position to wake up from because you can stretch out and start all over again. So the position does have um, have meaning. And I, I thank you for noticing that. <laughs> So I'm going to um, share some of the questions in the, the Q&A. Um, and this one seems really appropriate. The first one is from your son, Vincent. <laughs> he says, <laughs> I love it. He says, hi, mom, it's Vince. <laughs> that's, that's Looking nice. forward to the discussion. Oh, I love it. And he appreciates the compliment. So it was Vincent and America's son. Yes. Yes. Okay. Vincent nice. is America's son. Yes. And he and he is a historian. Oh. Excellent. By profession. He's a he like you, he's a professor. He's a but he's a historian. Oh, excellent. excellent. And so he's and they're learning from his mom all of the historical pieces we've seen in your work. <laughs> and then um Susan Reed, um Let's see, she's asking, what does the detail mean on the identification of the sculpture? So are when there, there are some slides where um, detail was in parentheses, typically that means it's part of a larger piece or was that a close? Would you like to clarify for Susan? Now, a detail was added by the museum and maybe it's because when it's a photograph of something, that's their way of doing it as opposed to taking something from a part of it. I did not mm. put the word detail next to them, but so I don't have a, a notion. But they're, it, they're, each of those pieces is three-dimensional with the exception of Blues Man's Break. They're all three-dimensional and therefore there's another side to them. So what you're seeing mm. is only part of what there is to see. Okay, and I just got a message from, um, Adam, yes, that's correct. They did add it, and yes, that is a detail. Yeah. Okay. And so from Scott, we have what do you consider you meant when your art was launched onto the national stage? What did I cons I didn't hear the first what part. do you what do you consider your moment where your art was launched onto the national stage? Oh, gee. Mm -hmm. When it was launched onto the national stage. Perhaps when a gallery actually took my work to a show in New York, that became mm -hmm. national because it was not just in California. Um, but there, there are any number of things. More recently, when a famous 
uh, celebrity, Angela Bassett, wrote an article that mentioned and had a photograph of the Sojourner Truth that is now in her garden. Sojourner Truth number two. Um, and when she wrote an article in In Style magazine, so that lots of people now know about it, know about my work. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a good sign. What about the, yes. the doctors? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, you were breaking up. I'm sorry. Oh, my. So the, yes, I mean that, that's a um, that's a, the ignition of your your work and your recognition of Sojourner Truth to have that kind right. of exposure, right? I yes. would say this may be before, but okay, I'm not going to argue <laughs> with Angela Bassett. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. So um, I did answer Carolyn's question. She asked, "What was the name of the community called?" So, so Mesa, <laughs> put the plug in. For Mesa, although right. um, the instructor Ross Stockwell has since re retired, but we still have a um, sculpture program as well as many other studio courses. And so Julia has a question, is there a monumental project? Is there a monumental project you would create if you had full monetary support? Well, there's one in progress that if there was full monetary support would get finished it is a World War I soldier who was part of the 369th artillery, not artillery, <laughs> infantry, 369th infantry. Uh, they were nicknamed by Germans as the Hellfighter. And they were actual first American troops with arms in World War I. Had, uh, the United States had not sent troops to the fight uh, before they sent this uh, company of men. And were all black men from New York. Um, and they won numerous awards. And if, I, if the gentleman who was trying to locate this uh, monument, it's a larger than life monument of one of the soldiers. And so that's a project that I would love to see finished. And he's working on finding both the proper location and the, uh, the funds for getting it finished. There are some other things, yes, that I would love to do uh, with if funds were not an issue. And that's some of the pieces that you've just seen that are smaller pieces, I'd like to see larger. And in, in parks that have figure sculpture and in particular recognize women, not just famous women, but women who are the, the sustaining members of a great many families. And so I'm, I'm being told we need to, um, I will just take a, well, what I'll do, um, for the sake of time is I'll read some of the, um, the, the comments that you received. Um, Nina says she didn't know what to expect, but this was beautiful and she thanks you. Um, Tammy says we need at least two hours. <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there are a couple of questions about how you incorporate mathematics into your, um, um, actually to how you incorporate mathematics into your work, which is, is part of the sculpting process. But one is, do you, have you ever incorporated any of your students into your, your work, mathematics students? Yes, with their permission. Yes. I, have, I have had uh, a student model. The, the dancer, that, you, there was, that was a student who modeled for that one. Um, the man, the, I, the face, was the face of a student. I had a professional model for doing the body, but I, I used the, this particular young face because it, I, I just loved the way he did the intensity of his face. And uh, with his permission, because I took numerous photographs of his face, 
and then I used his for that. So only with permission um, have I done that. And then you have a um, Tammy Ray. She says you were her mentor back in 1991 to 95. And she mm -hmm. says, listening to you today was inspiring. And she says, I love oh, you and I miss you. you. Or no, it's Myrna. She signed Myrna. Myrna oh, yeah. yes, yes. Oh. <laughs> the name says yes. Tammy Ray, but she signed Myrna. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, it's Myrna. Yes, I, um, I am very much aware of Myrna. Okay, so one last question, question. and, I, and, and um, it's from Fern Nelson, and she asked, are there young African-American sculptors whose work you are excited about? No one I can name specifically, but there are, there are lots of times I see work that's very inspiring. Um, mm -hmm. but I cannot come up with someone's name specifically right now. And that's, a, that's terrible that I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no. because there, there's, there's some wonderful things happening yes. in the art world with young people. Some things capture your eye and sometimes we don't have the, the name, but I want to, and I'm sorry we can't get to more of the, the questions, but um, I'm gonna turn things back over to Alessandra, but again, I wanna thank you so much, um, Manuelita, for giving me this opportunity and Alessandra as well, for being able to um, have this, have a chance to share your story and your work with everyone. Oh, so you. I really appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Manuelita. Dr. Rogers, it was really wonderful. I was so excited to bring you together uh, to talk about, you know, the work. Um, I'm I'm excited that our guests will be able to come and see your exhibition. There's going to be many works on view at the Oceanside Museum of Art, uh, one featuring uh, Manuelita's work uh, curated by one of the staff members and also her pieces in the exhibition. 20 women uh, artists now, um, which is going to open March 13 and run until um, August. And so you'll have plenty of time and hopefully we will reopen our museums and you'll be able to go and experience the, the works in person. Um, but, um, but I just, this was fabulous. I enjoyed it so much. Um, I have to say that curating this exhibition, we had to do everything virtually. So I had to meet with all of the 20 artists virtually. And, uh, and I think that that brought in a, a kind of intimacy that was really wonderful um, because we were going through very, we're going through difficult times and it kind of brought us together. So, so it was all of the hopeful messages in your work and your works messages about humanity and, and coming together and, and strength and, and women, it's really, it's really beautiful. And Dr. Rogers, the, one, the way that you brought all this out also in commenting about the works was really fantastic. Um, so hope to see you again. Um, there will be other virtual programs. Uh, you can follow, uh, go to the Oceanside Museum of Art website and, and you will find many programs that are coming up. And also, if you want to stay connected, visit the museum website. Um, and then also, I wanted to point out, you can go and, and look at many of uh, Manuelita's work in, uh, on her website. And also, Dr. Dennis Rogers, visit our San Diego Mesa College World Cultures Collection, uh, because we have fantastic um, works there for everybody to uh, to enjoy so looking forward maybe i'll see you well i won't see you but maybe you'll come uh to another virtual program um during the the duration of the exhibition thank you so much thank you thank, thank you. you thank, thank you, you manuelita